So our focus is now shifting to congressional action on energy. I'd like to introduce the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Jason Gramey. He's gonna lead our next discussion. Jason is a respected voice on both sides of the aisle for his innovative approach to improving government effectiveness and impacting public policy. Hi, Jason, it's nice to see you again. Monica, always fun. Am I live and ready to roll? Go for it. All right. Well, thank you, Monica. I want to thank Maria and our uh, friends at NEI for the opportunity to uh, be with you here today. You know, I think anytime um, 2,000 people come together for a pragmatic, substantive, evidence-based conversation about confronting our economic challenges and addressing climate change, it's a good day for the country. And so I'm really pleased to uh, be part of this discussion and uh, obviously delighted to be here as a moderator or maybe really a muse for uh, the senior senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. As I think everyone knows, Senator Manchin is the ranking member on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, but more important than that, uh, Senator Manchin has been a unique voice of pragmatism and independence. He is a practitioner in the dark art of getting stuff done. And um, it's a real opportunity, I think, to spend about 20 minutes. Now, what I'm gonna try to do and I emphasize try, Senator, because we've done this together before, and sometimes I only get in one question, so I gotta make sure the first one's a, a real good one. I'm gonna try okay. to do three things, right? I wanna talk a little bit about what you've been able to accomplish in shaping this debate over the last 18 months with Senator Murkowski. I wanna talk a little bit about what's right in front of us right now, 2020, there's six months of real legislating happening, and I think there's some opportunities that um, I'd like to pursue with you, and then hopefully spend a little time thinking bigger picture about just the role of clean energy in this I think very significant economic recovery that our country is going to be undertaking for the next uh, several years. But so just to set the stage, um, at the beginning of this Congress, you and Senator Murkowski held a hearing, I had the privilege of testifying at, where you said you were going to bring a new era of conversation and bipartisan substantive discussion forward around a national economically pragmatic agenda to decarbonize the economy through innovation. The shocking thing is you then actually did it. You spent the next 18 months together, you met with your colleagues, you put together a piece of legislation that had the benefit of over 50 different pieces of legislation, almost 40 of them had been sponsored through bipartisan action. And so the climate debate has not been marked by a lot of collaboration and courage and pragmatism. How have you done it? What have you and Senator Murkowski been able to do together that has so significantly changed the arc of this discussion? And what can we learn from that? Well, Jason, first of all, thank you, thank you for having me and, and, and giving me a chance to explain how we have been able to uh, to get things done. And it really is pretty simple as we like each other, we're friends. <laughs> and it starts with that, the respect we have for each other. And, uh, and then basically our staffs, you know, sometimes uh, if, um, the, if the chairman and the ranking member don't have a good relationship, I can assure you the staffs will not. They don't think they have to. If the two members at the top, the chairman and the ranking member, have a good relationship and on top of that have a real good friendship, then it just permeates down. So that starts a cooperation of working together. When you always have somebody's back, when, I'm, when I mean by that, I'm never going to put something out trying to embarrass my friend because she's on the Republican side and I'm on the Democrat side. We always have discussions. We meet once a week. We went through all this. We had bills on the floor. We had amendments. I mean, when I say on the floor and the committee, we had amendments on markup. And rather than just voting it down, we would try to have amendments to the amendment to help somebody make it better. You don't see that anymore in Washington. So basically, if somebody would try to put a poison pill, which means it make it hard for people of the other uh, political party to vote for, because it would be used against them in, in, in a political ad, we eliminated all those. We wouldn't let those happen. We says, give us something constructive that you want, and we'll see if our colleagues want to help it make it better. So we took that approach from day one and went all the way through. We looked at an all-in energy policy, and, and we both come from energy-producing states fossil fuel energy producing states, as you know, West Virginia and Alaska. But with that, we know we can do it better. 
And the market's going to determine coal is on the downturn, as you know, in my state. Uh, but still yet, there's a place for it. And there's a way that we can do it and do it better. But on the other hand, we look around the world. It's called global climate, not North America climate, not West Virginia, Alaska climate. So if we're going to look at global climate, let's look and see what the rest of the globe's doing. And there's more fossil fuel being used in parts of the world than ever before. And it doesn't look like there's any, any easing and letting up much uh, to that extent. So we thought you hear so much about elimination. We're going to eliminate this and eliminate that. I said, basically, we should be innovating. Markets will eliminate and determine what direction you go. And now with, with uh, renewables coming on so strong the, and, and so uh, uh, competitively priced, that's a whole nother ball game. In West Virginia, we have an ocean of energy underneath our feet, which is the, the natural gas and the wet properties that come, come from, the, uh, from the natural gas and also the ability for us to reinvigorate a, a, a manufacturing base. There's a lot of good that can come, but we think we should be able to, to extract that, uh, that product very safely, not flaring it, not letting it escape. We think there's ways that we can be done and it should be done. And we think that should be done practice all over the country. And if not, take the technology around the world. The same as we have scrubbers now. I remember in the days when they were putting scrubbers in West Virginia, we had the northern coal fields were higher sulfur. The southern coal fields were lower sulfur. Southern coal fields were mostly metallurgical coal, where made some of the finest steel in the world. Northern coal was used for steam. Well, when they started putting uh, the Clean Air Act started coming into place, then there was basically a cap, and you had to basically adjust that until the technology caught up. So what they did is they start shifting where they bought their coal from. Yeah. Northern mines shut down, and my I had some large largest mines in the world were in my in my home area, they start shutting down because the demand wasn't there because the sulfur was two, three, four percent sulfur content. They went down south to one percent and was able to comply. And then we had scrubbers and low NOx boilers and bag houses for particulates. Mm -hmm. All that came on board. Well, the northern coal fields came back because now innovation allowed them to compete. So, Senator, the this so, idea of you know. Innovate, don't eliminate. I think um, the prior panel talked a lot about this kind of broadening conception of clean energy. I think one of the things that's really changed the dynamic constructively, and I think your committee's had a lot of, to do with this, has been to broaden the solution set, right? The you know, yeah. American Energy Innovation Act has been about an all of the above strategy, but towards decarbonization, right? You, you managed to get past this kind of you know, magical thinking of, let's have red team and blue team exercises around science and get past the magical thinking of we can just, you know, pick a date and say, we're gonna decarbonize in eight years. And you really started to drill into the role of nuclear, the role of direct air capture, the role of CCS, battery storage. Talk about that, that changing conception. And am I right to be optimistic that the Congress has kind of moved past the bit of the magical thinking on the edges and is now really more focused on real solutions? Well, we know there are solutions out there. We know technology and innovation can, can solve a lot of the problems that we have. And we're all in agreement to that. The thing you got to be very careful is, Jason, as you start moving your energy policies, you are not going to move all the people uh, from those areas where their roots are and their families are and all that. So then what you have to do is use the policy changes you are and use the incentives for policy changes, such as tax credits and things of that sort, to make sure that you're attracting people to the areas where we displace the jobs because mm -hmm. of the changes. And I've said this before. In West Virginia, we can build you, a coal miner can build you the best windmill you've ever seen. They'll build you the, the photo cells, whatever you want, we can do. These people have been very innovative and creative all these years. Give us a chance. So if we do that in, 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 in a bipartisan way and the changes are coming, we leave nobody behind, we can all survive and come out the much better at the end. So as this moves, this energy market moves around, we're our main goal is to basically reduce our carbon footprint and show the rest of the world and lead them. So if you want to say, okay, we have no, in a sovereign country, we have no rights as United States. No, we don't. But they all want to participate in our markets. We can use our trading policies to make sure they're using the technology that we've been able to show under commercial load works. 
So let me let me drill down a little more, no pun intended, on um, questions around nuclear innovation. One of the key components of the American Energy Innovation Act was the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, NELA, which uh, we of course we talked about a little bit, which really brought I think a strong bipartisan voice together around this notion that nuclear can play a significant role in a long-term decarbonization strategy. Um, what's your expectation for moving different components of the Innovation Act forward? And in particular, I think there's some real ambition to try to get NELA into the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, focus with me a little bit on the next six months. What do, you, what do you think we can do in 2020? Well, first of all, we, we had discussions that you didn't see in, 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 the, in our rooms, our, our, in, in our committee rooms, how in the world can we run the greatest military might the world has ever seen on nuclear, but we can't bring it into the manufacturing base, large or small? So we start looking at that, and that's when we start looking at micro reactors, things of this sort. Shouldn't we at least, I mean, I know there are people out there objecting to that, uh, but on the other hand, shouldn't we at least explore? And that's how we start moving the ball forward on that, because it just made sense. And uh, I think with that being said, you're going to see more and more. And then we had Bill Gates. Bill came in and, and, and spent time with each one of us uh, unselfishly. And I think it was extremely innovative and creative. And it's exciting to see what he's willing to do. And he says, listen, I'm not, I'll put my money where my mouth is. He says, I think this needs to be done. I think we can do this. At that time, he was looking at financing with China, which we were very, uh, uh, very much opposed to. And we shut that down. He says, fine, if you're going to shut that down, what is the DOE going to do? U.S. DOE, Department of Energy, what are you all going to do? How much of an investment in technology? Will you step to the plate? Can we make something happen? So we're working on those things to, to truly change the, the, the dynamics of what has been done in the past. But we think there's so much more than, you know, NDAA, that's a big part of NDAA, as you know. We're yep. working on that. Uh, so the uh, Nuclear Energy and Innovation and Modernization Act, uh, it was enacted last Congress. So I just think, you know, with the regulatory commission, uh, to fly, they need to supply a plan to reform uh, the nuclear licensing process. We think that would help tremendously. Uh, an efficient, stable regulatory. I think anytime you have certainty, people understand what the risk factors are. And they'll jump in and get involved. And we're hoping they do. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about, you know, forward-looking innovation policy and the role that that can play in helping with the economic recovery. The Energy and Natural Resources Committee held a hearing on job impacts in the clean energy sector and found that several hundred thousand clean energy jobs have been lost over the last several months. Yeah. At the same time, we have not seen a focus on clean energy investment yet as part of the kind of larger recovery discussion. Now, I think in fairness, Congress has done quite an impressive job of just dealing with subsistence and helping people survive while not working. As we turn the corner, as we come back after the summer and start to think about infrastructure investment and you know, recovery and stimulus, what do you think the role is for clean energy in that conversation? Oh my, uh, first of all, clean energy is so much more competitive now, you don't need to keep pouring money at it. The market demand is there and the results are, you know, they are what they are, they're great. So with that being said, how much more do you have to pump to you know, incentives and tax dollars to continue to keep that. We had to get it basically where it was competitive and now it's become more than competitive because innovation has, exceed, has accelerated to that point. Uh, there is going to be, I believe, uh, Jason, there will be an, an infrastructure bill. It might be part of the next CARES package that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's as, The CARES package that you see coming out of the House is not going to be anything what you see come out of the Senate. With that, we're basically evaluating how the money's been invested now. There's people that we know have taken advantage of it. The abuses that have gone on. Uh, people received it. Companies even gave back billions of dollars. Uh, so we had to close those loopholes. But there's still people hurting out there. Uh, so as we come out of this, we're trying to evaluate what the second CARES package will look, at, look like. We've never seen our country come out of an economic uh, downturn such as this, a recession or a depression, without infrastructure. It's been the key. Uh, grid reliability, basically, the, you know, the efficiencies in the grid. And we talk about efficiencies in our energy bill, which is still on the table. We're trying to resurrect that. We've been held back because if we had two senators that put a hold on everything, 
uh, and wouldn't come to a compromise because of HFCs. They wanted to, that should be not in our committee. That's not our jurisdiction. But it got thrown into our bill and stopped it all. We're hoping they're coming to an agreement that they can start negotiating the BPW co committee to where we can move forward on our energy bill. No. But when I spent the low hanging fruit in our bill, Jason, as you know, was efficiency. Yeah. It was a low hanging fruit. Every, it was a win win. And the jobs that come from it in my little state and all the states. So we're looking at these jobs. They're very important to us. But the downturns of the jobs loss was a downturn of the economy, not a not downturn of lack of investment. I think it's on demand for energy like it was. You know, we just had a complete downturn and, and a lack of consumption. So we think that'll pick remind our audience that we're going to let them into the questioning here in uh, a couple minutes. I have a couple more, though, that I want to sure. lay out on the table. And one is this question about scaling. You know, a lot of the focus right now is on innovation. And I think there is a growing bipartisan consensus that the strength of America has been in that kind of R&D and research. But the scale of this challenge, as Ken Kimmel mentioned on the last panel, is just profound. And one thing about technology is it doesn't scale itself. There's been some growing support around ideas like 45Q, which once you saw a technology then provide a real tax credit to move forward. Uh, our prior panel was talking about clean energy standards. How do you see the ability to get bipartisan movement around making the kinds of investments to accelerate the deployment of this kind of new technology transformation? Well, again, as I said, the, the concern in West Virginia or Alaska or any state that's a large traditional energy producer, whether it be coal, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, the lack of opportunities that go if that if, if that new technology comes on, where where do you leave these these states and these communities and and the families? That's the thing. So if you're not compassionate towards that and understanding we leave nobody behind so in the transition in the rules that we make and tax laws i always say follow the money follow the money the money jason will take you it'll either take you in disparity or in prosperity one of the two but if you're willing to share if you're willing to say listen we're not going to leave this sector behind now in coal let me give you we have added value to coal coal my goodness uh, water filtration so much carbon fiber manufacturing so much can be done and we need to be looking at that too, but still for still making, we have the finest coking coal in the world. And that's gonna be used for quite some time. We can mine it in a much better environmental safe way. We can consume it much better with technology and innovation. We can do all those things. But as the market changes, you can't protect the market and say, oh no, we're gonna to continue to protect this market because we can do that by transforming how our tax credits flow for the new technologies. So if there's gonna be fusion, hydrogen, whatever it may be, you know, and there's going to be components made. Can't you force the manufacturing into the areas that have lost the jobs that basically produced energy before that you're replacing it with? That's all with, with policies, good policy. And does the idea of kind of a technology neutral but low carbon standard kind of shifting from renewables over to a broader imagination that would include CCS, include advanced nuclear, do you think that that has appeal in the Congress? I do. I really do. Uh, and and the, the appeal basically comes, even those who don't sit on our committee and don't have the benefit of having a, a very competent, qualified staff behind you, giving you all the information you need, if they're not exposed to that there, if they don't have the fear factor of what am I losing? What am I giving up for you to prosper? What am I giving up? Okay, what, how am I going to replace the economy and, and the wherewithals for people to make a living and to live their life and sustain themselves? Once you're able to relieve that fear factor, everybody's minds opened up to take. I've never had anyone push back. And if I can do it from West Virginia and show there's ways that we can move forward and still have the quality of life that we've enjoyed and the families being able to, to live where they do, want to, my biggest challenge right now is internet connectivity. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't compete unless we have connectivity. So I'm fighting hard for that. But once West Virginia and some remote areas of our state is able to com really compete and connect with the world, as long as an internet and fast and reliable internet, their understanding, their 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 limitations are not there, and expectations should be high. Let me bring up one more tough topic, and then we're going to turn to some questions, which I'm sure will all be softballs. This country used to build big, great, giant, wonderful things. Yeah. The scope of the climate challenge, in my mind, is about scale. We need industrial strength decarbonization, and we need it very, very quickly. 
reflect with me a little bit on our capacity to build big things in this country and what we can do around the siting and the permitting to accelerate the transition to clean energy. And that's whether it's uh, you know, converting an old fossil plant to an SMR in West Virginia or siting a big sequestration facility or dealing with a giant battery storage facility. We're running out of time. And I think I am hopeful that you're gonna see some more movement to try to accelerate permitting in the service of decarbonization which is not the way the conversation has been really framed up until now. But do we have a regulatory system that can tolerate the success of decarbonization? I would like to think that we could segue into that to where we're able to adjust for the demands that are needed for us to compete. If not, someone else is going to fill the void. Uh, but sometimes they just throw, uh, they're throwing caution to the wind and, and, and a lot of the regulations and deregulating things that we still need, that we fought hard for. I've said there's not a person in West Virginia I know that wants to breathe dirty air, drink dirty water. Not one human being in my state have I ever met that wants that. And now that, that we know that and they see it can be better and cleaner and be done in a way that still provides opportunities, they're willing to make the changes. So I'm willing to work with them. But for us to sit back and basically put impediments because the fear factor is wrong. And if public leaders don't stand up and say, no, this is nothing to be, this is something to embrace not to be afraid of so that's where that's where leadership comes in and we've got to move forward and basically we're talking about clear air carbon removal when you think about that they says what you're going to suck the air and remove it? you know we're thinking big and we're going to have to have this type of big thinking and and moving forward to make these things happen we know that we can't it can be done we know that all right senator the, the popcorn questions are coming here on my screen to my left i'm going to have a chance to ask you maybe two of them one of them reflects on uh, the conversation that happened in the panel before us, and this was the issue about the federal market structures changing in ways that are making it harder for existing nuclear facilities to continue to compete. Uh, Ken Kimmel with the Union of Concerned Scientists talked about a study they did which looked at what would happen if the existing fleet closed down. Maria Korsnick mentioned that there are a number of existing facilities right now that are really kind of on the margin. Um, is this an issue that the committee is focused on? I think when you get into the kind of market structures and FERC, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. But how concerned are you that we're going to start going in the wrong direction if we wind up shutting down our existing non-carbon generation sources? Well, I, I can tell you one thing. If, if we're going to continue to move and talk about decarbonization and not going to move forward with nuclear, we're in serious problems. You talk about an oxymoron. I want to decarbonize, but I want to get rid of nuclear. Doesn't make any sense to me at all, Jason. Okay. And I, I've said that if, if you can believe this or not, in my state of West Virginia, the thought process was way back when that you could not build a nuclear plant, nuclear power plant in West Virginia. And the reason for that, we had an abundance of, of natural energy we wanted to use herself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thought that's changing. Those that, that old thought process is changing. And with that being said, if we can run, and, and I've always said this, if we can run uh, the might of this military and do it safely for the years that we've been able to do it and not thinking that we can overcome this and be able to do it in a safe manner, disposing of it. We're having a hard time with that. You know that that's been the biggest problem that we have. Uh, and it's still a, a point of contention uh, right now of how we're going to dispose of our nuclear waste. And uh, so once we're able to pa move past that, and it's been far too long, the same, I've been here for 10 years now, and the same discussion comes up every year, uh, you know, and, and then we have the same people from Nevada, uh, our friends who are concerned, and they're saying, hey, just put us on level playing. Let's find out if there's other parts of the country, rather than just saying it's got to be here. So we're working through all these uh, concerns that we have, but uh, I just think that nuclear, I truly believe it has to be a major factor, and it can't be going backwards. One more question, it's long, and I'm going to try to summarize it, and it's about the role of nuclear in the global supply chain and national security. You mentioned earlier that one of the strengths of our country has been to export technology solutions. The question, as I'm summarizing it, is the concern that if the U.S. is pulling back from its nuclear industry, are we ceding territory to countries like China and Russia that don't have America's best interests at heart? I guess the question is, do you think that there is a national security rationale for sustaining a domestic nuclear industry? Well, I'm always concerned about that because of manipulation and, and, and uh, the way other countries support uh, these industries when they want to take over markets. But we've got to be very, very concerned about uh, the future of the nuclear power plants becoming competitive, cost competitive. 
if that's part of our portfolio, then we've got to find ways that we make them more competitive. And that's the problem you have. And when you have manipulated markets such as China, other parts of the world that basically step in and offset a lot of the costs, it's unfair competition. And we've always said that. So we've got to make sure that we're able to, to compete, but also be able to innovate to where we are the leaders. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, we've always been the innovators. It's always been the country people look towards. And uh, other parts of the world that are more acceptable toward nuclear and want to go that direction uh, for many reasons, uh, we should be uh, where they turn to. We should be the country they turn to. But if we can't compete with what China is doing and how they're basically getting into the market area, then it's going to have a hard time for us to be able to make the case. And if we can't keep our own uh, nuclear generation power plants competitive, cost competitive, uh, then it's all for naught. Uh, they're not going to go the direction that we're going to go. So I'm going to ask you to wrap this up by making me feel good. And that is to ask you to talk a little bit about the optimism of going forward. What you and Senator Murkowski have been able to do, I think, is really fundamentally take a conversation that was quite toxic and turn it into something that was really pragmatic and productive. And at the same time, as you know, the former Governor Cuomo said, you, know, you, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Your bill is a sonnet. It is a 53 pieces of legislation integrated in a serious way. How do we make pragmatism exciting enough for people to pay attention, right? Your bill does not proclaim magical thinking and say, we're gonna eliminate greenhouse gas emissions in 10 years. You do not avert your eyes from the challenge and say that this is, you're doing serious work. What can we do to help you get the country to focus on the serious work of making practical progress towards decarbonization. Jason, first of all, think of this. We had over 70 legislators involved in that process. Seven. So you th there's only 100 of us. So you think everybody doesn't have a, a, their hand in, in, in energy in, in their own uh, states? They very much do. Uh, if you look at what we were able to do in just the last year, uh, Lisa and myself, the Great American Outdoors Act is a perfect example. Yep. Here's a piece of legislation. They've been teetering with it for over 50 years. And basically, we came together. First of all, we've got the Land Water Conservation Fund, and we were able to get permanent authorization, came right back, and I introduced the bill, permanent funding. And we were able to debate that. Some of our colleagues on our committee were not in favor, but we were open to the debate process and saw that there was support and some adjustments we could make. And on the other hand, then we had a tremendous, I think, a $12 billion backlog in our national parks, our treasures, that needed to be upgraded. We were able to bring two bills together to bring almost an entire uh, caucus on both sides, 80 votes. Uh, but we were able to do it in a process that worked because it was open and debated. When you don't have open and debates, you have a hard time. We have a, an energy bill that has worked in our committee for almost a year or more. And it, it brought everything from innovation to basically uh, cost savings, energy efficiency, to all aspects of nuclear, uh, to all aspects of basically uh, uh, renewables, and even using all of our fossil to decarbonize through innovation. We tried to look at everything in a reasonable, practical, because I said, listen, we're not going to be able to tell the rest of the world how to do what they're going to do. We can show them. And if they want part of our markets and they're going to participate in what we've been able to do and how we've done it, and I think that's the the desire to basically want to do something that can be done, showing that it can be. And I've always said this, if you can prove that you have a new technology and you're able to put the money that you can, and you're able to do it for a 12 month period in a commercial, in a commercial setting, showing that it can be reliable, dependable and affordable, then I, I just don't think there's anything that can prohibit us from changing the ways we've done things before and also changing how the world does things in the future. And I feel very optimistic that we're in a position to do that. And we have a committee that wants to get something done. We're the most productive committee in the Senate. I agree. And we're, we're that way because we don't look at Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. We look at the problem before us, the challenges we have, and how do we move forward? Well, Senator, that is, of course, why I have the deepest respect for your leadership. I think I can speak on behalf of uh, 
NEI and thanking you. I'll also note that nuclear technology requires a lot of precision, and I've always found that NEI likes to really run things on time. So I am going to uh, thank you again, thank Chair McCarrisky, and then turn it back, uh, Monica, for you to uh, wrap this up. Thank you, Jason. And we're thank three you. minutes over, but nobody's noticing. Thank you right? so much. I pre I'm sorry. I, it's, that's, that's, not, that's not bad. For you. For you. That's, that's, a, that's a win. That's okay. That's, that's a big W. Thank you. Senator Manchin, thank you for your time. Uh, and Jason, thank you also. That was a really excellent discussion. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the sessions today really provided a substantive look at how important nuclear energy is to our future to address the climate crisis and to maintain U.S. leadership in innovation. I want to thank all of our panelists for an important conversation um, and for their unique perspectives. And despite the challenges we face today, this is the decade in which new nuclear technologies will come to market to solve big problems. It's an exciting time for this industry um, and never has it been more crucial that the U.S. succeed. So thank you again for joining us and stay safe.